Hello, friends, and welcome to Conversations with Consequences. We are the radio show and podcast of the Catholic Association, where we aim to change the culture one conversation at a time. You can listen to Conversations with Consequences on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network, Saturday mornings at 7 a.m. Eastern, or catch the Encore at 5 p.m. We are also on Sirius XM Channel 130. Of course, our radio show is always a podcast. Go to thecatholicassociation.org slash podcasts or directly to wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie, and joining me today as co-hostess is Ashley McGuire. Welcome, Ashley. Hey, Gracie. And we have a special guest today, and his name is Tom Carroll, and he's the former superintendent of Boston Archdiocese Catholic Schools, who has a new venture. He's been on the show before. He's an old friend, and he's always right in the right where he where where Catholic education ought to be that's where Tom Carroll is welcome to the show Tom thanks glad to be on with both of you so you had a you had a big job as superintendent of Boston Archdiocese Catholic Schools and I feel like you moved on to a bigger job which is it, it embraces the entire country the in, the entire country and, and Catholic schooling which here on conversations with consequences and at the Catholic Association is a very big a very big deal for us so tell us about your new project and and what you're hoping to achieve. Sure. First of all, just a little backdrop on my five years in Boston, because that really gave birth to this idea, is I came in as, uh, I'm a Catholic convert. I converted about 20 years ago. So I never attended Catholic schools myself. So I never taught in them or was a principal one who ever worked for a diocese. I joke, if I had worked for the church, the world's oldest bureaucracy before, I probably wouldn't have applied for the job. <laughs> but but at any rate, what I came to it with a fresh set of eyes. I had run very successful urban charter schools in Albany, New York. But when I came in and looked at a lot of the schools, there were a couple of things that struck me as off. One, that a lot of the people in the Catholic Church believe they're playing a losing hand and they act that way. And I, I don't think if you're trying to get, I don't think you draw brought people to yourself having a hangdog face. I think uh, optimism and joy is a lot more appealing. And it's one of the reasons the joy of Catholicism is one of the reasons I converted. I think it's a naturally joyful faith. So first I had to show that there was a way forward and that it, it was not as Cardinal Dolan once called it, we using a kind of dark Irish sense of humor. He said, Catholic education has become hospice care. We know the patient's dying. We're just trying to manage the pain on the way out. Oh, that's dark. And right. And so you have to know his sense of humor to know like that's not mm. the desired state. He was just trying to make a point. So that's what I encountered, which is a lot of people just thought they were playing out the, you know, kind of a final death scene of a very long opera. So one, I wanted to show that that you could actually stop the fall of enrollment. So you had from 1965 forward all across the country, with exception, interestingly, of Miami because of immigration and Lincoln, Nebraska, which is like the most Catholic place in the United States. And the reason I came to believe that it was going down was that, that the Catholic schools had lost their way. And I concluded that my job needed to become putting the Catholic back in Catholic schools. And it had to start with putting the right team on the field. And if the goal is, if you believe that the goal of a Catholic school is to evangelize children and to bring put God back at the center of their life and then set them on a path to eternal salvation. That affects everything you do in terms of the design of the school, but most particularly the people you put in front of them. And this is the segue to why I founded the Catholic Talent Project. So St. Paul the Sixth in 1975 said, modern man more willingly listens to witnesses than to teachers. And if he listens to teachers, it's because they're witnesses. So I came to the conclusion that one, he was completely right, and that we needed to put a witness in every single classroom. And we also needed to put a witness in every school leader position. And broadly across the country, that you need to have a witness in all the different superintendent jobs around the country. Because if you have a lukewarm superintendent, they then appoint lukewarm principals. The principals hire lukewarm teachers. You then have have a lukewarm school and it attracts people that actually don't agree with Catholic teaching. And then you end up running basically a secular school that charges private tuition. So I proved in Boston, I, I stopped for the first time enrollment was stabilized since 1965 for almost the entire five years that I was there. And I turned over 75% of the school leaders and then started an initiative called the St. Thomas More Teaching Fellowship, which is continuing into my new venture. So I basically, if you're familiar with the Federalist Society, they basically, they've developed a talent pyramid. The first, the foundation is all the district court judge appointments. And then 
whoever is, you know, trustworthy as a district court appointment ultimately get put forward for a circuit court of appeals. And the people really, you know, trustworthy get put forward for the Supreme Court. The most amazing kind of turnaround of an institution and led, as you know, to the, the fall of Roe v. Wade, for example, and a court that now is solidly Catholic, but also uh, very fervent in its defense of religious freedom. So in a different context, we're taking the same strategy. The bottom of the talent pyramid is the teachers. That's the frontline experience that every child has. And then out of that, I will identify people that have the potential to become school leaders, and then I will train them up over time. And then out of that, uh, I will grow uh, people that I think will be spectacular superintendents. And so after I left, I came in five years ago, I knew when I took the job that Cardinal O'Malley uh, was going to turn 80 this past June and then would be retired. It's a normal retirement age for a bishop. Uh, they have to offer their resignation when they're 75, but they pretty much have to leave when they're 80. So uh, he's leaving in October. And as they joked to me, I guess we're going off into the sunset together, Tom. <laughs> so he's going off to do whatever, which hasn't been announced yet. And so I left uh, in June and in July, I launched the Catholic Talent Project. And the goal is to cultivate educators who are fully Catholic and the faith is alive and to put in these witnesses uh, in all the different positions, all the way up the food chain, if you will, the talent pyramid of Catholic schools. And I do, and the, the backdrop for this, which is really important, is, as you know, there's been a lot of articles on disaffiliation people walking away from all major religions. But on the Catholic side, the numbers, which uh, the, the CARA group at Georgetown puts out every year, by the time kids who are raised in Catholic families, not the general public, but specifically Catholic families, 50% of them lose their faith by age 13 a staggering 86% lose their faith by the time they're 18. So we have in Catholic schools, we have kids from preschool through 12th grade, literally for 16,000 waking hours. Well, I joke, there may be a couple of math classes they may be occasionally snoozing in, but but that's a massive amount. It's more waking hours than parents have their kids if they send their kids to school. I mean, homeschooling parents would be different. So, uh, so the question is, how could we take a, a church that's offering a religion that's offering infinite mercy and eternal salvation and has a joyful disposition to it and not be able to sell that in 16,000 hours. And we created, and by the way, along the way, we created Western civilization, um, you know, and we have the, a Catholic, you know, the Catholic intellectual tradition rivals any other intellectual tradition since the dawn of mankind. So, and we have the largest global footprint of service to the poor, the dispossessed, the marginalized. So we have a lot to work with there. And I think the reason we're not, we're not selling it is, most schools don't believe in evangelization. They think that's kind of what Mormons do or evangelical Protestants, but polite Catholics don't do that. They're dead wrong. And then, and that led to me being very careful about everybody I hired for principal jobs to get people with the right frame of mind. And it's just people that we have, it's messy in any diocesan school. Not everybody agrees with what the church teaches and not everybody lives the life, you know, of virtue. And so the kids watch this and when they're little, they may be short, but they're not stupid. They see the hypocrisy and it's not always compelling. And so uh, I think we have to basically reboot the whole system and it all starts with getting the talent. And so I've dedicated you know, kind of the balance of my working life to finding the talent around the country, starting with two dioceses, Boston and San Francisco, and then eventually adding two major dioceses every year. We're talking to Tom Caro. He's the former superintendent of Boston Catholic Schools out with a new venture called the Catholic Talent Project to improve Catholic schooling across the United States. Tom, what you're saying resonates so much with me. Um, we have five kids and you know, they are a mix of Catholic independent schools and Catholic parochial schools. And it's, I was just so amazed to see the way that the parochial schools handled the COVID pandemic. And I know that that was something that you were, you know, neck deep in. And I think really showed the public the difference between a Catholic education and everything else, because they were the ones that opened up even before the fancy privates that charged, you know, $70,000 a year. And they just the, the commitment to education just was so different. And, and it's been really sad to me to see, you know, what you're talking about these, um, it, the kind of diluting of that culture. And it's it's really costing the schools. And I, I'm seeing just in my own community, the way that people are kind of peeling away the faithful Catholic families from parochial schools in many cases for some of these Catholic independent schools, 
but there's room, you know, there's room, the, the world is wide enough. We need both. And so I think what you're doing is so important. How are you vetting the talent? Um, you know, what, what's the profile you're looking for? What are like the, the key characteristics that you're looking for in, in these um, Catholic educational leaders? I think that's a really good question because what I'm looking for is completely different than what everybody else is looking for. And so I never run into people competing with me for talent because nobody else is looking in the same way. But the the reason is what, what people traditionally do, they say, oh, I need a teacher. So where's the obvious place to go? Well, I'll go to a teacher's college. And then even people who know that many higher education institutions have gone stark raving mad. Well, an education school is also a higher education institution. And often, and often they're the most woke part of the higher education institution. But they're teaching things like how do you do lesson plans and how do you, you know, align your curriculum. All of that stuff is important. But that's actually the easiest part of it. Because I was I was in Boston. We had 3,000 teachers. I had plenty of people who could teach. If I got somebody spanking fresh out of college, a four-year degree, I had plenty of people who could teach them that stuff. And it wouldn't take two years to teach them that either, right? And so I've always been a fan of the Teach for America model, which is strip down to what you really need to teach and do it over the summer and then put them in a classroom. Because you learn a lot of it, you have to learn by actually doing. Uh, much of the way if you're learning carpentry, it's not just all like reading textbooks. You actually have to, you get better that you refine your craft over time by actually performing it. So what I started to look for is the characteristics that could not be taught. So if, Number one is I'm looking for people who believe in God, right? Now, that sounds funny for like a Catholic superintendent to say, like, it's so obvious. But we have lots of people who have been hired who either are not religious or if they're Catholic, they they disagree with everything from human a vitae forward. And increasingly, people that have come out of, you know, the ed schools in the last few years don't agree with Genesis. God created man and woman. So if you take my view is, is you take the viewpoint that you as an individual get to decide what is divinely revealed truth, then you basically have made yourself God, which is a very un-Catholic way of looking at it, right? So you either believe in the whole thing or you don't believe in it, right? You can't believe in some and not the others. You you know, you could be basically like a congregational Protestant and do that, but you can't be a Catholic and take that approach. So I'm looking for people who are all in, that people believe that agree with the moral teachings of the Catholic Church, including the tough stuff and the things that sometimes make you squirm because it all hangs together in an intellectually coherent way. And then I'm looking for people who are intellectually curious. And I joke, I'm looking for somebody who's got three, four books on their nightstand, which they may never finish, walk by an independent bookstore and buy another three or four books hmm. that they may not finish. That's like the only addiction I'm in favor of, right? Because I think that that thirst for knowledge and reading whatever you're reading is contagious. And when kids see that, I think it's a good quality in parents to always read in front of their kids because they see how much joy you get from reading. It becomes contagious. And so I think that's really important. You have to have a certain personality. I joke, if Winston Churchill came back to life, I wouldn't listen to him for seven hours a day for 180 days a year because it, it's what we ask of teachers to keep people to be so compelling that they can keep the attention of students at a very young age for a really long period of time requires somebody that has a lot of charisma. So if, with no disrespect to library science people, but I'm not looking for library science personalities, right? And I say that with all respect. My mom used to work in the library and she doesn't have that kind of personality. But so I'm looking for somebody who has a, I joke when I'm talking to a guy, like I'm looking for somebody who looks like they can play rugby, even if they don't, right? So I'm looking for, you know, you know that kind of personality. Then I'm looking for work ethic, which again, sound like 20, 30 years, it not sound like it, you know, overly right, but you wouldn't have to ask that question. So, but I'm looking for people that ever since they could work, depending on the state, 14, 15 to 16, for it, that they've had a job. And the grubbier the job, the better. I mean, literally, if they were picking cigarettes out of a urinal, I'm more likely to hire them than if they were a tennis coach in a country club hmm. that their mom or dad mm -hmm. lined up for them, right? I'm not looking for spoiled rich kids. I'm looking for people with some grit because going into a school in which most of the people don't agree with you, like how fervent you are, and just being a first-year teacher, no matter what the circumstances are, it's really, really tough. I mean, it can bring you to your knees on certain days. So what I'm telling people when I recruit them, like strap on your cross. I mean, that's what this is going to be like. And you have to say, for the sake of saving the souls of the children, I don't actually care about saving schools. People got annoyed when I said that as superintendent. Our job is to save souls any way we can. And so that's the focus. So that the, the joy that you'll get as a teacher the first time 
you bring a child newly to God is just completely exhilarating. And all the sleepless nights and all the aggravation from overbearing parents from time to time will all like just fade away in the distance if you're able to pull that off. And then I am looking for somebody who I think has the personality where they can lead a child through conversion. And that means you have to have the ability for children to know that you love and care deeply about them. Because if you don't, kids can sense it. And then you'll, you will not be able to get out of what you need to get out of them. So that's, that's a tall order, but those things are really, it's, I can't teach somebody. If, if somebody doesn't pick up a book or hasn't in a while and they're 22 years old, they went through all the way through college and they're not excited about learning. I, I can't fix that. Somebody's never had a job somehow got, got coddled all the way to 22. I'm not taking a bet on a person like that. So anyway, that's what I look for. And I find there's an unlimited supply of people who are missionary oriented, who are looking for something to do. They often, and I don't think this is a knock on them. It's very difficult to decide what you want to do for your entire life, right? So there are a lot of kids, I joke, I'm going to become the full employment act for unemployed little arts majors. There'll be nobody living in their parents' basement once this program gets fully launched because nobody will have to. Tom, um, you, you're you very you're very descriptive when it comes to the person sitting in the classroom, the teacher in the classroom. And and, and, it, and really, it, it makes so much sense to me. I also have five children like like Ashley and I've been and my children have been in Catholic all types of different Catholic schools always uh, as I w I'm also a Catholic school product. What I've noticed is that you can have great teachers in the classroom but if the leadership of the school doesn't have that mentality of these children are ours because we're going to make sure that they get to heaven. <laughs> and if the mentality is, you know, oh we're going to have the best academic program and the best fields and we're going to attract we're going to have a long list of of parents um, on the waiting list, get trying to get their children in that that competitive like they're competing with the uh, many times competing with secular private schools for the for the same pool of parents. Um, how do you get the right person in the right people in leadership positions with the right it's with the real, right with the yeah. right? Uh, I'm sorry, I was going to say with with the proper idea of Catholic education. Like, what's it for? Yeah, there, there, there's t it's very challenging, but. First, you have to decide what the goal is, right? So it, so I have a very clear vision of what I think the school should be, right? And I, so I need, so out of the people that applied for principal jobs in my five years, I excluded 85% of the candidates, almost solely on a religious litmus test. Mm -hmm. Right after I went in as superintendent, conveniently, the Supreme Court issued a case called Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, the name of a uh, side uh, being the name of uh, Our Lady Guadalupe is the name of a school in California. And they basically took the proposition that a or reaffirmed the proposition that a religious institution is allowed to discriminate based on religion. Now, discrimination is a bad word, but it means to make distinctions. Right. So, for example, if you're uh, Muslim, you can't become a Catholic priest. You have to be Catholic to be a Catholic priest. So the Supreme Court took that and basically said the same applies to teachers because teachers have a central role in, in being the evangelizing force for the, for the Catholic Church and the schools exist for that purpose. And they said this generically for religious institutions. And so as a result of that, because the Supreme Court in very direct language said, you're allowed to make distinctions on the basis of religion based on the free exercise of religion clause of the First Amendment, our lawyers were very cautious, said I could ask any question that related to Catholic teachings, including the moral teachings. So I went through, I asked people every question you could possibly imagine about what they believed in, what they didn't believe, what their faith practice was, how often they go to confession, do they go to adoration, <laughs> you know, where do they go to church, uh, you know, what's their interior life like, and so forth. And a lot of people looked at me like, he just committed five or six felonies by asking those questions. And then I'd back up and explain the court decision and the reasoning and, you know, and all that stuff to them. Because in a corporate setting where your religious belief should have nothing to do with whether you get a job or not, it should be illegal. But in a religious setting, it's completely appropriate to make sure that the person carrying the message to the church actually believes in it. And because they're obviously, if they're not, if they're an inauthentic witness, they're not really a witness at all. So that's what I did. And so, and then I, I traveled all across the country. Almost everybody I'd met, I'd find out, anyone I met in education, I basically without them knowing it was like secretly in my mind interviewing them to see if they were the right kind of person. 
sometimes I've, I've offered people principal jobs over lunch. I had a case of person in a charter school, uh, a girl in seventh or eighth grade became pregnant. The principal and the other faculty of the charter school in Boston were suggesting she go to Planned Parenthood to have an abortion. And then the person I was having lunch with was telling me that he was told he could not have a conversation with the girl about adoption options um, because that was religious, which it is. <laughs> but I mean, obviously, Catholic Church is pro-adoption, but it's not you can have that position without being a Catholic. And so I got him to become a Catholic school leader because he did not want to cooperate with moral evil anymore. And so I made him a principal of a school. He did a spectacular job. So like literally everywhere I go, and teaches anytime I find any parent or a grandparent that has a college age kid, like I end up, I, I've met people in, in bars. I met people just at lunch or I just, I could be at a charity event anywhere. I'm always quizzing people, the age of the kids, what they're studying and so forth. And then just, and I just meet an unbelievable number of kids who at freshmen all the way through senior year. And then sometimes work on them for like two, three years to get them to become a teacher. So th there's literally nobody else doing this. And because the superintendent jobs are many, it's very hard to do while you're doing everything else you're supposed to do. So that's why I thought with the Catholic Talent Project, since I, I have an interest and a passion for cultivating talent, by identifying people, I think I have a really good eye for talent, but also cultivating and and. So people that I've brought in at different levels, I've made people at very young ages, I've moved them along into an apprentice principal, then an assistant principal, then a principal job. I've hired like three, four people in their mid twenties to be principal, which is very unusual for a diocese. But I thought they'd be great at evangelization, had the personality, they were strong leadership. They wouldn't be whipsawed by parents who wanted them to change the school, so forth. So um, it's just, it's a contact sport. You have to talk to an awful lot of people. And you have to sort people and you have to be willing to say no. I had a guy who told me, I asked him to, when he goes to church and he, he said, well, I, I work on the weekend, so I don't go to church. I said, well, where do you travel for business? He said, Chicago. And I go, like, are you telling me there's no Catholic churches in Chicago? There's one like on every other corner, you know? So it's just, when that happens, I just ended the interview. So there's a bunch of times I've done that. So, but I, I bet you in any other, lots of other superintendents would have just, in the desperation to have a warm body, would have sent, if, if they could get a letter vouching that they were Catholic in good standing, they would have sent the person forward. And that's a huge disservice to the future of all the kids whose souls are in the custody of that principal. Um, Tom, I remember one of my kids, they, they're not at this parochial school anymore, but um that school while we were there had a change in the superintendent and that was a huge deal. It was, you know, the previous superintendent who was a nun had been there for I think decades. And um, it, it really kind of shifted the culture of the school. And so I know how kind of seismic those leadership changes are um, for the families. How are you kind of executing this? I'm just thinking of how much went into just one change and you're talking about multiple superintendents. Are are schools approaching you? Are you approaching the dioceses? Are you working with chancellors? How are you actually? Uh, yeah, so I've been in conversation. Leadership changes. Yeah. So I've been so once I started doing this kind of my fanatical recruiting all over the country. It got a lot of attention. So I, I've got a lot of calls from superintendents and bishops over the years. And when I explain why, and they were wondering why, like I was spending so much time out of the archdiocese, right? And people within the archdiocese, you know, thought it was odd too, right? So I got criticism in, internally as well. And thankfully, the cardinal, who's uh, a holy Franciscan, you know, backed me up every time. He knew what I was doing and, and was, you know, behind it. But uh, a lot of other people thought we should just hire people out of the education. The education schools were fit to be tied. But, but anyway, so right now, I'm looking the, the virtue of just doing two a year. Boston's obvious because I know everybody there, right? And then, and San Francisco, I had conversation. There was a change in uh, there was a vacancy in the superintendent, and so that led to me having a, a, a pretty long sit down with Archbishop Cordelione in San Francisco, and uh, I worked with him and a bunch of other people. And there was a search firm and so forth, but somebody that. 
uh, I know really well and actually used to run retreats for me for the St. Thomas More Fellows Program. He was a theology teacher at Portsmouth Abbey and ran the Portsmouth Institute. Uh, he ended up becoming superintendent. So the combination of him as superintendent and Coeur d'Alene, who's got seven years left, which is a lot of time to do what we need to get done here. So, I mean, if I knew if I knew what I know now, when I, on the day one, I could have done 10 times as much. But Coeur d'Alene is, you know, I, I spoke to Chris Fisher, the new superintendent, and, you know, he's as, he's as strong of a backbone of any bishop that I've ever met. Mm-hmm. So I think, I think uh, they're going to do amazing things. So he was very interested because he knew Coeur d'Alene knew I was recruiting people, for example, at a Thomas Aquinas College in California and getting them to, to move 2,400 miles to work in Boston, but they weren't going to San Francisco. And so I explained what my sales pitch was. And I don't, I don't go in and say, hey, do you want to be a teacher? I say, hey, do you want to save the souls of a generation of children and along the way save the Catholic Church? And you know, Tom, the, the right person jumps at that, right? And I, that, must be, that must be wonderful when, when you say that to somebody and they jump. And eighty percent of the people I've recruited never plan on being a teacher. Oh, that's amazing! You know that gives me a lot of hope, Tom, and I think it gives our listeners a lot of hope for Catholic education because we do see the problems. We see the lack of Catholic identity, right? It's a lack of Catholic identity in so many Catholic schools. So, thank you so much for for joining us and telling us about your new project, which is called the Catholic Talent Project. And we're going to where can we read about it? So and and. And, and pray yeah, along so with the, you. Thank you. And the website is catholictalentproject.org. My contact information is on there. My wife thinks I'm a little crazy putting my cell phone on the website. But uh, so I talk to people all the time um, if they need advice uh, on their own situation or want to know more about what we do. Just ask everybody who's listening, who any grandparent or parent who worries about the faith of their children or grandchildren to pray for the success of the Catholic Talent Project. Thank you. Welcome back to Conversations with Consequences. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie, and I'm joined by two co-hostesses today, Ashley McGuire and Lee Sneed. Welcome to the show, ladies. Hey, it's always so fun to talk with both of you. Absolutely. We want to talk about a couple different subjects that interested us this week. One subject has to do, well, in my mind, it has to do with the Eucharistic revival that American Catholics are engaged in on one level or another. We just had the beautiful Eucharistic Congress where tens of thousands of Catholics were attended, and there was a, it was a truly beautiful. And it was so gorgeously reverent. And the idea, right, is that the Eucharist is the source and summit of Christian life, and that as Americans, or maybe Catholics in general in the West— we have fallen away from the from the knowledge and the the concept that Jesus is actually present in the Eucharist, and that should change everything for us. That's a that's such a concept that it should color our entire lives. Like the fact that Jesus gives Himself to us as food, and that is such a it's such a spiritual and material reality that's so spectacularly life transforming and miraculous that for us not to have that right in the center of our consciousness as Christians, we're missing out on the main thing. And we were looking at this very interesting piece in the free press that went viral, and it's about young Catholics bringing back the veil. And I know that I'm seeing this at Mass, uh, women, young women especially, coming in wearing, you know, a cute little uh, lace veil. What does that mean? And I think we should we should think about it and talk about it in the uh, the setting of this this Eucharistic revival, this idea that the Eucharist is the source and summit of our life and how we approach it makes a difference. So the article interviews several women uh, as to why they're wearing the veil, which was something that basically largely went away after Vatican II uh, and is something you usually only see in the traditional Latin Mass, which uh, has been restricted under Pope Francis. Pope Benedict lifted those restrictions and he reversed that. And I think a lot of people think it's this kind of like old-fashioned curmudgeonly thing or something just strange or fringy or misogynist um, 
That's like the worst accusation, right? Well, and it's worth it's important to point out that the women who are wearing the veil today are doing it because they want to. But one of the women in the article that this connects to what you were just saying, Gracie, said that she de- she wears it because it's a reflection. It's the way she shows that she understands that she's in the presence of something holy and and different from the material world when she's at mass, and that is the Eucharist. So there is, you know, we we just finished this Eucharistic revival, and the articles about the revival of the mantilla and so i just thought it was interesting to see that you know somebody made that connection you know a sign that there there really is an actual eucharistic revival going on because th- th- there's a connection between that and women choosing to wear the veil when i was watching coverage of the of the of the eucharistic convention i was thinking to myself that you can tell people that something is special but we are embodied souls so we have to we have to also manifest that in a material way ourselves Right. So how you approach something special is by doing special things. Right. So when we uh, I, for instance, I don't like to take communion in my hands because I was taught since I was very little. I I think I grew up mostly in pre-Vatican II Catholicism because I grew up in Mexico and and it was after Vatican II. But things hadn't really filtered down to where I was learning Catholicism from nuns and Carmelite nuns and I was told that the, because Jesus was present, I shouldn't touch him with my hands because you don't approach that kind of re, that kind of royalty, that kind of divinity, and 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 manhandle it. So a lot the way that we do things physically and the way we that embodies how what we're thinking and what is in our hearts. And I think too, I think like it's normally the custom for most people, I think anyway, to you know dress up a little bit and not to wear gym clothes to mass just to show that you know you are some it's a something special something good is happening here something very that only happens here and there are a lot of comments like that in the article from the interviewees the first steps are really just to i think get people to stop wearing street clothes gym clothes i think and then you know then they maybe they can open their minds up to seeing like oh this is something very special and also that i think we we you guys touched on it a minute ago like you thought you know i think and i thought too because once i was at a, a tlm and i was told it was optional to this is many many years ago optional to veil and then I was handed a veil by a male parishioner. And I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> and, but then once I sort of understood it, actually, in the, the Alice von Hildebrand quote that's brought up in, in the article about how you, know, you veil things that are special and sort of seeing it through those eyes rather than just like this grouchy man handing me the veil, I was like, oh, this is something special. This is the way we s- present ourselves to receive the Eucharist and acknowledge how special it is in our lives. Well, and to your point, I find that often Sunday is the only day I wear a dress. You know, Mm -hmm. I have five little kids and that's the one day of the week that I know I'm going to pull out a dress. And another woman in the article said she likes wearing it because it's pretty and feminine. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, it is. Lace is beautiful. Like women love to wear lace. And interestingly, the article also points out that Corinthians tells men they should not cover their heads in church. And that's why we tell our kids, you know, take a baseball cap off in church. I mean, my kids don't wear baseball caps to church, but maybe if it's like a daily master, if we walk into a church, if we're Mm -hmm. visiting a city, the men take off their hats and the women, and it's, it gets to sex differences that we're different and that women, you know, whether they're at mass or not, the way we often like to express our feminine difference is by wearing feminine, pretty things, dresses, feminine clothes and that that's sort of a continuation of that yeah well, but, but on this on this top on this issue of sex because i think that's that's where a lot of the objection to veiling at, at, at church i think comes to this sex difference right so we have this overpowering drive right now in our modern western culture to demolish sex differences and if we if we do something and we say well this is a female this is a female prerogative, or this is a female trait, or this is this is a way a female dresses that's different from men. Then people say, no, 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 she ought to do whatever the man does because what men do are what the things that men do are better somehow. So we should be like men, right? So the prerogatives of men are better, and we should grab them and forget female prerogatives. But there's something very feminine about veiling the hair to cover the hair, and I think we could we could talk about that for a minute because it's it's very much tied into like these deep foundational traditional ideas about the beauty of woman and that the beauty of woman resides in her hair and that a woman's hair is somehow extremely attractive and extremely extremely beautiful and and there's there's time and a place where you let your hair out and time and a place where you cover it because you're concentrating on other things than 
than your physical attractiveness or showing off your hair. And maybe now we all have great hair, right? Because I, I for instance, my hair is like a part-time job. I have to dye it and, and, <laughs> and I have to do keratin and, and I have to do uh, uh, toners and dye. You know, it's like, it's a part-time job, my hair, now that I'm 55. And it used to be that a young woman had this, how was her, that was her crowning glory, Right. And then after a few years, you don't have a crowning glory because you're not spending a fortune on your hair and hair dyes don't exist and neither do keratin yeah. or straightening irons. And so anyway, all, all to the point of there's something very feminine about hair and covering the hair. That's very traditional and very old fashioned. It's in every culture, right? The hair, the covering of the hair for a woman. And that's something that people now in the modern world, they can't resist. They can't, re they can't not they can't say, oh, a woman should act different from a man. And and yet, all the beauties of our lives are tinged with this sex difference. Like when whenever we are most beautiful and most alive, there's something very spectacularly different about us as women or someone else you, as a you man. See, yeah, you see even modern brides, um, even if they go all out with a big poofy white dress, will reject the veil as some sort of an you know, see, like, I haven't, I haven't seen like, that. I'm not going to the right yeah. weddings, Lee. Everybody, all the <laughs> girls I see wear the mantilla. <laughs> oh, that's, I mean, yes, I'd like to see that too, but I feel like I've seen so much rejection of it as being some kind of archaic, you know, like uh, putting, like putting thing, it, it just instinct, even like, even with religious women, you know, I think there's just some sort of instinctiveness. Like I had when the man handed me the veil, I was just like, oh no, I'm not supposed to do this kind of thing. This is what not what's expected of me as a modern Western woman, you know? Um, and I, I think they just think like the idea, you know, I mean, at the next thing they go will be dads not walking their daughters down the aisle because that's too patriarchal too. So, you know, another, uh, let me say something else about veiling is that uh, in in some cultures, the mantilla, or in Mexico, they call it reboso. Um, it's a, it's you wear it over your head, but and it's like a big shawl, right? It's a place where you put your babies, also, right? You yeah. you you put it over your head, and the baby, you know, and it wraps around the baby, and it wraps around your shoulders, and it's like a, it's a one stop shop, like, and that's your, that's your maternity. Somehow, your maternity is also part of the veil, and I've thought of this when I. Um, in, 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 our, in Cuban weddings and in other, this is a Spanish custom and it exists in some Latin American countries in Cuban, in Cuban weddings, the, the, the bride wears a mantilla and at one point in the ceremony, the husband is placed under her mantilla. So one corner is lifted up and it's placed over his shoulders. And then um, part of the ceremony takes place with him under her mantle. That's lovely. Is that beautiful? That's the Beautiful. veiling. The veiling is also part of our maternity because the veil represents what the woman brings to the family, to culture. It, she brings mm. this, she brings shelter, she brings nurturing, she brings, she brings safety and, and, a, and, a, and a place of repose and, and perfectness, you know, for, for her husband and her children and for the wider community, for everyone, right? You go running to a woman when you need someone, <laughs> someone's shoulder to cry well, you know. You also, speaking of maternity, I mean, pretty much every image of Mary, she has I a veil. I was just thinking yes. that. Yeah. And it's like, it's another way that we emulate her. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the, you know, you referenced grandma. There's another woman in the article, I thought it was so interesting, said that she realized that her grandmother wore mantilla because she was worshipped pre-Vatican too. And she wanted that connection. Mm -hmm. um to her grandmother to just worship the way her grandmother worshiped and it shows you know again that like we're embodied people and we're also people who uh, the, our family ties matter to us and and we yearn to have those those connections to our ancestors and there was just it, it was a really interesting article that i th i thought showed the many very understandable reasons why why w women are reaching back to it but yet yeah, you know i I don't remember if it actually pointed this out in the article, but it showed a picture of a statue of Mary. And I thought, I can't think of one image of Mary where she's not veiled. That's at least in many modern ones. But when our lady, um, when our lady of Guadalupe appeared to San Juan Diego, she said to him in his native language in Nahuatl, she said to him, don't you know that you're under my mantle? Right. So yeah. the mantle, yeah. the veil is we are under her mantle like this is this is the place of shelter the veil is the place of shelter 
It's it's the place where 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 we go home to. Maybe heaven is veiled. Like like maybe when we go to heaven, we pierce a veil and we exist under this veil, right? The we exist under the veil of heaven uh, when when we die and we're good, <laughs> and God saves us <laughs> from the other fate by His grace. Yeah. How wonderful that our that people are looking for reverence. I think it's wonderful that women and men are doing this too in their own way. They're looking for the reverence that makes life beautiful and that makes life meaningful, right? Like if you, if you don't have things that you reverence, then why live, right? Like that's despair is from lack of reverence. Like you have to revere. So are we seeing in our parishes, ladies, are we seeing mostly young people that are, are starting to be I mean, I go to a Novus Ordo parish, um, you guys too, or, you know, who, who do you see veiling? Well, it's definitely young women. I think it's it's grandmothers and old women. So, sorry, it's it's older women and younger women. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that goes back to my point about how I think, especially young women today, I think feel so unmoored. Like we live away from our families. Um, we're you know, we didn't we we're not raising children in a community like our our mothers and grandmothers did, mm-hmm. and so. Again, I think that it goes back to this, you know, we we want connections and one way we can find that connection, the, the veil is like almost a symbol of connection. It's a connection to our lady. It's a connection to um, the women that went before us. Um, it's a connection to other women. You know, you it's a way of seeing that there's other other women just like the, the the reason that we dress nicely at church is is sort of a communal expression of reverence for the holy place that we're going i think you know that for these women i mean and it's worth pointing out that none of the three of us wear the veil um but we can all respect and understand why why women do and probably why it gives them a deeper sense of meaning and connection to the the people that they're worshiping alongside the other women yeah, I liked the quote in the article about um, the woman wondering if there were some kind of requirements because she saw all these kind of like cool girls at mass wearing them and she wanted to join their club. Yeah. And she wanted she wanted that sense of belonging. And then she was like, seemed to be relieved when there weren't requirements, you know, and so she went out yeah. and bought a veil that day. Um, yeah, but I think that's right. There is something about it that can be really special. I liked I liked the woman who was like, yeah, every day I leave with my keys, my yeah. like wallet and my veil. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. You know, veils, can I can I put in a uh, a plug for veils that I don't wear them, but they can be very chic, right? Oh, oh yeah. They can yeah. be very Some chic. Some people have a whole veil wardrobe that coordinates <laughs> with their Sunday bests. I see I have these beautiful photos of my my own baptism. They're black and white and everyone's beautifully dressed and all the women are wearing little square veils that are not exactly, they're not big, but they're square and white and, they, and they're and they pinned on their heads and they look so pretty. <laughs> they're, they're, yeah. it, it's a time, I, it also harkens back to a time of more, um, of prettier dressing, of more intentional, like you you didn't leave your house without your lipstick and your hair is beautifully done. And, well, and you didn't receive your husband either coming home from work <laughs> in your old right. sweats. <laughs> like your appearance mattered. I think that's also very beautiful about the veil. Yeah, absolutely. And one other thing I was remembering too, you're talking about pictures is uh, first communions, girls wear veils. So yeah. it's an, it's another way of connecting back to the different sacraments. I mean, yeah, it used to be uh, weddings and first communions that, you know, this is, a, a again, this a way of connecting back to sacred rituals. That's right. The first communions. Let me, let me hope that I still see all the little girls around here wearing veils in first communion. I hope that that hasn't gone by the wayside in, in the rest of the United States. I think it, yeah. it isn't, but, you know, if it's slipping away, clearly this veil revival is maybe a, a foreshadowing of, of a revival of veils of all, of all stripes. Well, let's hope so. Let's hope it's all centered around a real, um, a re-grasping of, again, the source and summit of Christian life, which is that Jesus didn't leave us orphans. He stayed with us. He stayed with us in the Eucharist. And... What could be more important than than to know that and to act that out and and to go running to him and and to receive him and with all the reverence that 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 the reception of God calls for? So thank you, ladies, for joining me. Thank you.
Every morning, the Catholic Association reviews all the latest news and sends our subscribers a carefully curated collection of the most important news of the day. Items are specifically selected for a smart Catholic audience like you. Don't let the world take you by surprise. Subscribe to our daily media roundup at thecatholicassociation.org. And now, Father Roger Landry offers us, as is customary, a short and inspiring homily to prepare us for this Sunday's Gospel. This is Father Roger Landry, and it's a privilege for me to be with you. As we enter into the consequential conversation the risen Lord Jesus wants to have with each of us this Sunday, when after several weeks of focusing on Jesus' words to us in St. John's Gospel about Jesus' amazing self-gift of himself in the Holy Eucharist, we return to St. Mark's Gospel, where Jesus will speak to us about the type of homage God expects of us. This applies to every interaction we have with God, but similarly in this ongoing Eucharistic revival to the way we treat him in the Holy Eucharist. This Sunday, we have a dramatic scene in which Jesus and his followers are criticized by the Pharisee for not obsessing about the ritual hand washings traditionally done by Jews before a meal. Jesus, truth incarnate, responds with force and clarity. He calls them hypocrites, literary actors in Greek, and cites the prophet Isaiah against them, saying, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines human precepts. Then Jesus tells the Pharisees, you disregard God's commandments and cling to human tradition. Jesus' words that the Pharisees were only seeming to serve the Lord while their hearts and actions were doing otherwise would have come as a great shock to his listeners. The Pharisees were considered extraordinarily faithful Jews. They went to the synagogue every Saturday. They prayed at least three times a day. They fasted twice a week rather than just once a year like other Jews on the Day of Atonement. They paid tithes on their whole income rather than just on the things explicitly mentioned in the Mosaic Law. They used to walk to Jerusalem a few times each year to celebrate the major Jewish feasts like Passover at the temple. They washed before every meal. They only ate kosher meat. They wore special clothes. And yet in all of this, Jesus, the triune God through Isaiah, says remarkably, This people pays me lip service, but their hearts are far from me. And Jesus was right. The people who did all of these religious deeds were also the ones who ended up conspiring to kill Jesus, working together with their arch enemies, the Herodians, the Sadducees, and the Romans, to have Jesus arrested, tortured, and ultimately crucified. Their hearts were indeed far from Jesus. They were in fact not authentically religious at all, because in their hearts they were murderers instead of worshippers. But they and many others thought that they were exemplary believers because of the way they scrupulously adhered to human traditions above God's clear commandments. St. Mark describes this Sunday in the Gospel the complicated and rigorous practice of Jewish ceremonial washings, something that God had not revealed that he wanted done, but something that the scribes in the 4th and 5th centuries B.C. had developed to foster what they called ritual purity. They needed to wash their hands in two directions with exactly one and a half eggshells of clean water, first pouring it down from the palms to the fingertips, and then with their fingertips down to their palms. This was the religious practice they obsessed about, as if such collectively neurotic hygienic washings of hands, cups, jugs, kettles, and beds were what would help them to grow in God's image and live in love with each other. In response to their challenge, Jesus summoned the crowd and taught them about the purity God himself wants. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus praised the pure of heart, saying, They shall see God, and reminded us, Where your heart is, there will your treasure be. Jesus had come into the world not to show us how to wash our hands, but to give us a heart transplant, to take out our heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh, cleansing us so that we might receive within the love of God, treasure it with gratitude, and then love God and others as God has loved us first. And so Jesus says to all those assembled, Hear me, all of you, and understand. Nothing that enters one from outside can defile that person, but the things that come out from within are what defile He emphasized that nothing coming from the outside, either touching a jug or a ritually impure person, or even anything we eat, can make us impure in the sight of God. The purity that God cares about, he said, is what comes from the heart. The heart is the real core of the person, pointing to what we love and desire. It's what's in the heart and the actions that flow from the heart that render a person pure or impure, holy or sinful. Jesus states that it is from the heart, from what we desire, that sins like evil thoughts, unchastity, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, blasphemy, arrogance, and folly all come. 
These evil desires, Jesus says, are what make us impure. And we see several of them, especially malice, deceit, envy, arrogance, and murderous thoughts on evident display in the actions of the Pharisees. Jesus wants all of us to hear him and understand the truths he is describing. He wants this conversation with the Pharisees to be consequential in the way you and I understand our faith and live it, especially with regard to him and the Holy Eucharist. Do we honor him with our lips or with our hearts? Do we say to him and mean, as St. Peter said last week, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Or do we pay greater attention to celebrities or presidential candidates or others vying for our constant attention? Do we say to Jesus in the Eucharist, like St. Thomas the Apostle, my Lord and my God, and treat him with awe and prioritize him? Or do we relate to him as if he's just bread and wine? Do we disregard God's commandments in favor of human traditions, cling to our own preferences of the ways we'd like to worship God? Or do we do this, the Eucharist, in Jesus' memory as he commanded? Do we treasure his self-gift in the Eucharist, or are our hearts set on worldly things? Do we really mean the words we pray at Mass? Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, my soul shall be healed. Or do we give him lift service, just saying those words as if we're not really sinners in need of his word to make us clean? Do we try to receive him with love and purity of heart? Or do we come to communion with hearts defiled by evil thoughts, unchastity, greed, malice, deceit, envy, arrogance, or even by licentiousness, theft, blasphemy, adultery, and murder? Do we truly adore him, or do we worship him in vain? These are important considerations because there are many today who do what Jesus warned the Pharisees not to do in today's gospel, in this Sunday's gospel. They try to substitute human traditions for God's commandments, like the pseudo-commandment to be nice over the Christian duty to call people to repent and believe. They substitute football stadiums for churches on Sunday. They substitute politically correct ideas on human sexuality, gender, sex, marriage, and family for what God has clearly revealed. They supplant the commandment not to kill to prevent the destruction of human life in the womb or in hospitals or in nursing homes. They replace God's command to love our neighbor as ourselves with justifications for treating migrants and refugees or the poor and needy or those of other races or religions with hardened hearts. Or to keep things more particular to the Eucharistic revival, they cling to liturgical preferences about music, priests, homily length, or even parishes, more than they cling to Jesus himself in the sacrament. Jesus in the Sunday's gospel is trying to call the Pharisees and everyone else to conversion. The point is not to become like the Pharisees and obsessing about how others are living, rather than examining our own hearts. It's to make a commitment to ensure our souls are as clean as the Pharisees wanted their hands to be. It's to honor the Lord with both our lips and our hearts. It's to cling to his teaching in all its beauty and fullness. It's to take great, great advantage of the sacrament of confession, in which God power washes our insides. It's to ensure that we place our treasure in the things of God, Seek the opposite of what Jesus condemns. That means that we commit to chastity, to generosity, to self-sacrifice, to faithful love, to goodness, truthfulness, integrity, happiness over others' gifts, praise of God and others, humility and wisdom. It's to respond to Jesus who says, Hear me, all of you, and understand with great attention, comprehension, and action. The great way we do this is at Mass, as the Eucharistic revival has been striving to make clear. This is where we come to honor the Lord, to worship him, not in vain, but with our lips, hearts, mind, soul, strength, and voices. It's where we come to cling, not to human traditions and desires, but to God and his commandments. It's where we recognize that while nothing enters, that enters from the outside can defile a person, what enters into us in Holy Communion during the Mass can sanctify a person, provided that we receive Jesus as he desires and deserves. It's where Christians conspire not to put Jesus to death, but to enter into his passion, death, and resurrection and come out of Mass in allegiance to bring Jesus to the ends of the earth. This is the consequential conversation Jesus wants to have with us this Sunday. God bless you. Thank you so much for another exceptional homily, Father Landry. To check out more from Father Roger Landry, make sure to read all of his writings at the National Catholic Register at ncregister.com. And you can listen to his homilies at catholicpreaching.com. We hope to have you back next week. And until then, you go with our prayers.